Hello everyone. Hey, to all you seasoned travelers, or maybe not so seasoned travelers, I'm curious if you've ever felt fear for your life when the turbulence of the plane is bouncing you around, tugging your body against your seatbelt, and people are starting to get sick or almost getting sick around you, and you're, you're constantly watching the flight attendant's face, hoping that they never show signs of fear, because then if they do, you know you're in big trouble. Or maybe you're the person that thought that that one mosquito in Africa was definitely the one that was going to give you malaria, even though malaria hasn't been seen in that area for decades. But you still start feeling symptomatic, and the doctor cannot find anything wrong. But you swear you're the person that is going to uh, bring malaria back to that area for sure. Well, I have to admit, I have felt this way and some of these fears while traveling, and I am sure many others have, even some seasoned travelers. So I am Marcia Civic, and this is Be Provided Conservation Radio. My guest today feels this anxiety and more, yet he is probably one of the most traveled people I have spoken with yet, and it hasn't stopped him. Today's show touches a little bit about anxiety, mental illness, and how to deal with that when your work takes you around the world to these remote but beautiful exotic places. I love the experience and the intensity and, and the sort of the, the adventure of it, but at the same time, I'm terrified, you know. This is my guest today, Jeremy Hans, a freelance environmental journalist and author of the recently published book, Baggage. Confessions of a Globetrotting Hypochondriac. So today we will be talking about Jeremy's travels, his new book, rare animals he has met along the way, and his way of coping with his mental illness in life and while traveling. You may have read some of Jeremy's writings before on mangabay.com or The Guardian's Radical Conservation blog. And you know they are very serious stories of nature, the environment, and exotic species. His new book, even though a serious topic, is humorous at times and very openly personal. I started out our conversation asking Jeremy if it was difficult to transition from the the writing the serious scientific articles to writing a book that is very personal and open about his mental illness. I mean, it was really hard. You know, it was a really big change. This is my first book, and so it was really... And it wasn't really that like, I was like, ooh, this is the project I want to do. It was more that like this project just sort of kept bugging me. The idea of writing about, you know, the trips that I've been fortunate enough and blessed to have these experiences, but then doing so in a way that captures sort of the struggles of mental illness and sort of being as open and candid about that. You know, I, you know, you, you have those concerns about, is this going to affect my career? You know, I obviously had to talk a lot with my family and my wife and my child (laughs) about some of these stories and and getting this personal you know so it was difficult but in the end I feel like you know it seems to have resonated with people and I think it was I think it was definitely worth it you know but maybe my next book will be more of a straightforward (laughs) you know a little more a little more just focused on maybe a particular species or other things rather than just focused on a a sort of a gamut of things but a lot you know such a personal book but I think I think it was you know uh, having grown up with mental illness I, I was diagnosed when I was 10 it was it felt time that I could actually tell my story and mm-hmm. and hope that that story could be, you know, useful to other people who either struggle with mental illness or who live with loved ones or, or know someone who's struggling to kind of give them a sense of just what it's like. But at the same time, do it in a, in a way that's funny, do it in a way that also incorporates, you know, exotic places, beautiful species, some of the crises facing our planet. Like I didn't want it to just be a mental illness book, you know, book about many different things. But that was obviously, you know, a major aspect. And I was, it was difficult. And it was really, you know, it was strange to go from sort of writing pure journalism to writing about, like, the inner thoughts in my head. <laughs> um, it took a long time, you know, to kind of get that get that right. But I think I'm, I'm very happy with how it all kind of came together in the end. It does flow really well. So what got you involved with environmental journalism? You know, I, was Manga Bay your first big breakthrough as, as an environmental journalist? I sort of I basically got lucky and stumbled into it. I I grew up loving animals, but I also I'm a big book nerd. So I actually went to college for English literature. And then I went to what's called St. John's. It's a great books program where you read sort of the, the Greeks and the Romans and the Bible. And you sort of read all these, you know, Western literature, great things that sort of, you know, are, are sort of the pillars of a lot of our sort of culture. 
but it was during that time I had some extra time and I had just gotten back from this trip to the Amazon rainforest for the first time. And that sort of reawakened my younger passion for animals in the environment. And I just, I, I looked up places that covered tropical news, tropical mm -hmm. forests especially, and stumbled on Manga Bay, which has become one of the world's best places. And at the time it was really just one person. It was Rhett Butler. And I was like, hey, can I like write for you for free? <laughs> you know, I just was, I didn't have any experience in journalism. I had never had a journalism class. I mean, I knew how to write. And so he just kind of took me under his wing and let me do that. And I did that for, I don't know, six, seven, eight months. And then it turned into a full-time career. And it wasn't something I planned. You know, I wasn't like, I want to be a journalist. Like, so a lot of the early years were really just learning the ropes and mm -hmm. learning by trial and error and, and a lot of some failure. <laughs> um, and then, you know, over the time, getting more confident and having more opportunities. And, and Manga Bay has ballooned into an organization of, God, I don't know, like 50 employees, people, wow. hundreds of correspondents around the world. Like it's this incredibly well-oiled machine now. Yeah. And when I started, it was literally just two of two of us in our, you know, pajamas at home, like <laughs> writing articles. Oh, I um, did so that. It's, it's, it's amazing great. to have seen what has been accomplished. And then I, you know, started writing for The Guardian and other places too. So it, it was really just getting lucky. I mean, I was just really fortunate. <laughs> I I like I wanted to mention that, I guess, you know, you, you becoming a, a journalist, environmental journalist, because I think it's important for people to hear. You mentioned in the book, too, you're not a good activist or a good volunteer, mm -hmm. and writing is your way of giving back, I think. And same with the podcast for me. I'm very similar. You know, that's my way of... Yeah. So I think well, I people think need to find their niche and, you know. Exactly. Because yeah. like with my, with my anxiety, I have, you know, I have social anxiety. I'm an introvert. And so I'm not someone who like, you know, when there's, there's big protest, like I would love to get out there and do it. I, I, you know, I want to, but my anxiety holds me back and I have kind of had to accept that. Mm -hmm. Right. So the way that I can engage with the world, the way that I can hopefully add some small difference is through this writing you know or, or as you say for you through a podcast like i think or people through art you know there's so many different ways to get involved with causes that you care about and you don't always have to be i mean i i so admire the people the leaders on the front lines and the activists but you don't always have to be that person to make a difference like there are many different ways to get involved and make a difference and, and if that's not your skill set i think that it's important you know and, and the book is in many ways about sort of discovering your limitations and and how to live within them and still live a rich life right like that's kind of this part of the story of the book is me with my mental illness, mm -hmm. discovering my own limitations. And one of those limitations is I'm, I'm, you know, you're not going to see me at a rally anytime soon or marching. <laughs> you know, my wife will go. She loves that. You know, yeah. she's, she's, she's much more, you know, capable in that way. And I just, it would, I would have a panic attack in like five minutes. Oh, <laughs> like yeah. it would be so that's, yeah. this is how I can see myself contributing as much as I can. I think that's good. And I think it's good for people to hear. And have you been getting good feedback from your book? It's been out since October. Have you gotten any? Yeah. You know, I mean, people people really seem to be resonating mm -hmm. with it. You know, it's got it's got really good reviews on places like Amazon and, and, and Goodreads and things like that. And I just, you know, I get messages from people, you know, that I don't know and, and you know, asking about, you know, mental illness. I get, I get, you know, a lot of a lot of really good feedback, which is, you know, again, putting something out there where you're so vulnerable and putting so much of yourself uh, yeah. and, and yourself not always the best light, you know, <laughs> being truthful and honest about it. And, and again, in a humorous way, mostly. Yeah. But it's been really gratifying to see that it has resonated with people. And I think people have really appreciated it. It's a, it's a very different book than, you know, your sort of standard travel or environmental book. And I think people have appreciated that fact that it is a little of a different journey. You get to you get to know you and understand. Have you had any surprise correspondence with people who you've traveled with, or that that were kind of surprised to hear that? that you know, talking? that's such a good question. Yeah. Not really. I yeah. kind of wonder if some of them are like, "Oh, dude, like you were yeah. messed up." Yeah, because or like, things... was he feeling that way? I didn't know yeah, that. Was, yeah. Like, what was wrong? Like, <laughs> because one of the things that's interesting about mental illness is, you know, I've lived with it since I was 10. As I've said, I've been yeah. diagnosed and I've been in therapy basis since I was 10. I've been on medication since I was 10. Like you get to a point where you are very good at hiding it, mm -hmm. right? Like even my closest friends never or almost, well, probably really never have seen me at my worst, <laughs> you know, my most panicked. My wife has, of course, you know, there are people yeah. that have my parents and, you know, my therapist and stuff, obviously, but you get very good at sort of keeping that part of yourself in a little box that comes out, uh, you know, when you're at home alone and that's where it kind of rears its head. 
So I'm guessing that people that <laughs> traveled with me were probably pretty surprised at some of the stuff that yeah. I wrote about, and stuff that maybe happened in the in the dead of night that they didn't <laughs> know about. I hope that you know it doesn't. You know, I, I again, I, I don't think I I come across as a you know as as a flawed human and. I was, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at when I'm on the trip at being largely professional, you know, and, and sort of, but even, even then, you know, there are times in the book that you can clearly see where my interactions with, you know, my guides and my, and local people are, they can start to see like, Oh, something's wrong with this boy right now. <laughs> like, what is this white guy doing? Yeah. Like, so there are moments when, when the, when the beast sort of unleashes itself, but no, I haven't actually heard. And also part of that is a lot of the places I was going I'm going to places where, you know, English is not the first language, right? And they're right. probably not, you know, sitting down with a book in English. But it would be it would be really fascinating to hear from some of the people. We'll see. <laughs> There's time. So awesome. Well, even with everything going on with with you and, and anxiety and such, you've managed to travel, gosh, how many continents now? Five continents. Have not okay. been to Australia or Antarctica, oh. but all the rest of them, all the big ones. And then like over 30 countries, I can't really remember exactly how many but and, and most of the you know the book was entirely set in the tropical countries and places where I'm going you know specifically to sort of seek out certain animals or species or write stories on certain environmental issues mm -hmm. it seems like some pretty exotic places that you know it's easy to have some of these fears like malaria or dengue fever or <laughs> some snakes and and spiders as we talked about earlier but i mean some of the fears are very rational and i think yeah. that's part of the story of the book is like my my I, I tend to be extreme obviously in my reactions to how i deal with my fears my fears get overblown but there also is rational fears right like you're traipsing through the jungle you know and you have guides being like, oh, if you had, you know, there's this snake and this spider and, you know, and, and <laughs> this stuff and, oh, don't step near that tree, you know, <laughs> like, and it's like, what? <laughs> so, so some of it is, you know, it, and it, it, they are often short bursts of intense trips. So it's an intense experience, which part of that I love, like, I love the experience and the intensity and, and the sort of the, the adventure of it. But at the same time, I'm terrified, you know, half the time. So it's, it's sort of that juxtaposition of, my own personality where I love the novelty and the adventure, but at the same time, you know, I'm not cool headed at all. I'm just <laughs> in my head. I think probably, well, I felt that way before too many times, but so, mm -hmm. so you, you seek out, I want to talk about the exotic animals that you seek out and write about as well. But I also want to just on the traveling part, just ask you, you know, when you travel, do you have certain coping mechanisms? It seems like from what I read in your book, that you were in certain situations where maybe you were watching the dolphins or something, and it calmed you, and you didn't think about anything for a while. Do you, do you have to? Is it hard to bring yourself back into that spot, or do you have different ways that may help other people? You know how you cope with this during travel yeah. that you can suggest. I think, you know, one of the reasons that I continue to travel, even though it can be very difficult, is for those moments. Right? Mm -hmm. Is is oh. to spend time with these people the culture, the animals, all those sorts of things. So I, I definitely, I definitely get, it's not like I, I, it's not like I go on the trip and the whole trip is, is awful. You know, there's always these, these wonderful moments that make it totally worthwhile. As far as dealing with the anxiety, you know, I, it's part of it is just getting practice and getting good at it, knowing my limitations. Like I don't travel for more than sort of 10 days now, especially if I'm on my own, knowing there are certain places in the world I will probably never go. And that makes me sad, but it's just honest. <laughs> like they're just certain places me too much right but then it's it's having things like making sure i'm staying in a hotel that's now now that i'm a little older is you know relatively nice if possible or um making sure i have a lot of podcasts downloaded so i can get my brain off if i need to or you know that's making sure i have all my medications everything sort of laid out you know all, all those kinds of little things that you sort of do to to add a little comfort at the end of the day because i'm often going to places where you know it, it's intense and so right. but then it, you know the payoff is always the nature aspect right like the payoff for me is always be on the bee in a place like a rainforest in sumatra or you know the 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 okavanga delta in botswana you know to be in that place even for just a few days makes it all worthwhile uh, the anxiety of getting there the stress the panics the the all that so it you know and but I do, you know, you just kind of, it's its sort of like cognitive therapy, right? You have to work on ways to sort of calm yourself down and talk yourself down when, if, if the anxiety gets too intense. 
And it, it sounds like your your wife was a good support system too um, with traveling. Yeah, she's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I wish I could bring her on every trip because she makes it so much easier, and she knows me so well that she can help. You know, she can catch. But obviously, you know, we have a we have a ten year old, and also financially, like that's a lot of. You know, we, she can't come on every trip, and she's come on a few of them as we've you know had a child and things have changed, but. She is a really good support. And even when she isn't there on the trip, you know, she helps me sort of pack. She helps me talk me into it and yeah. talk me down. And when I get home, she knows that I kind of just need to like basically fall apart for a week, you know, to recover. Yeah. So she's That's she's uh, a real, I'm very blessed to have such a supportive and understanding spouse. <laughs> does, does your daughter like to travel? Have you traveled with her? We have, we've yeah. gone, it's, you know, we've not done the sort of the more intensive trips, but we have a uh, family in Ireland. So she's been to Ireland a few times. And from there, we've gone to last year, before COVID, we were in Ireland and then into Greece, um, which is one of my favorite countries in the world. And we've done like uh, Madeira, which is an island off Portugal. So she's been some cool places. She's like, for 10 year old, you know, she's already uh, That's awesome. been a lot of cool places and she loves it. She does love it. I'm really excited for when she's you know, a few years older, maybe 12, 13, 14, maybe I could bring her on more of a further afield trip. But I want to make sure that she's old, we're both in the right place to be able to handle, you know, the the intensity of that and that would that would the, Tiffany, my wife would need to come to because I think if it was just me <laughs> or if she's too young, you know, would be be a lot of her trying to deal with my issues. And that's not that's not good. Does she understand at 10? What you know, that oh, we're very open about daddy's mental illness. I grew up in a family that was because I was diagnosed at 10 and my whole family by that point had basically been diagnosed with some mental illness or another. Mm -hmm. We were all very open, at least with each other and understand like we were in family therapy. We we're all in individual therapy. We we're all on meds. We were in and out of the hospital. Yeah. So I've, we've, Tiff and I have really been very honest with her. And so she's very aware of, you know, what I struggle with. Obviously we do it in a way where I try not to show, you know, I try, you know, when I'm having a bad day or things are not going well, I tend to retreat which is what I need anyway. Yeah. So she doesn't, you know, need to like sit there and watch, <laughs> watch dad <laughs> be super depressed, but she's aware of, of what it is and, and what's going on. And I think that, you know, that is, I hope will be something that will help her through her life if, when she in, encounters people who might be struggling too. Exactly. I loved it. That's her, that's your daughter with you in the trailer for the book on your website. Is that her? Yeah. <laughs> that's adorable. Her name is Aurelia. She's, yeah. she's, she did such a good job on that. She's she's a real theater. Like she's she'd be she's gonna be really good on stage. I know, <laughs> I, I know. It's like wow, that's incredible. So, Natural. So I wanted to talk about some of the exotic animals that you've seen and written about, and and what you feel. What is like the most exotic animal that you've encountered? That's a really good question. I tend, as as a writer, I really love animals that are weird and that people have rarely <laughs> heard of. Right? Like I love yeah. the underdog. Like, not to say, like, I mean, I'm, I, you know, I love a good tiger and lion and whale, like, and all that makes me so happy. But there is something to me about the animals that no one knows about. So one of the animals that I write about in the book at the end is the selenodon, which yeah. is unrelated to anything else. It's, it's, it looks like a giant rat, but I find it very beautiful. It's got like this kind of orangish fur, this long snout. These, these old man hands, claws, like long, deep claws, pinprick eyes, just just this incredibly strange animal. But what's so interesting about it is it's it's distantly related to shrews, but it's really its own thing. Like there's And there's only two species in the world. Both of them are endangered. One might be extinct. So mm. this sucker is on the, the cusp of vanishing, potentially. Yeah. The, the really wild thing is this is an animal that was around during the dinosaur times. It's been around over 60 million years basically unchanged and that is, is to me mind-blowing when you think about mammals and how much mammals have changed evolved but here's a here's a species that was around during the comet that killed all the you know not all the dinosaurs because obviously some have survived and become birds yeah. but you know wiped out most of the dinosaurs and this mammal survived that it survived you know first humans it survived all these different things and it's so i went very purposefully, I flew to the Dominican Republic. I might be the only person who's ever gone to the Dominican Republic, which is a beautiful country in the Caribbean, to literally find this giant rat mammal. Like, I didn't go for any other reason, not for the beaches, not for the hiss, like all that, you know. Yeah. It was all, it was all wonderful, beautiful country. 
but I went to find this thing and we did. And that's part of the story. And it, it, you know, that's the kind of animal I think that, that I love to go travel for because you're telling a story that hasn't really been told mm -hmm. about a species that really has very little conservation attention. Yeah. You know, this, this beautiful animal that is so unique, that has these unique attributes that no, like very few living mammals have, that's his own evolutionary branch could go extinct. And, you know, few people would even know, like know or care. And we would lose this incredible relic. So, you know, I went to try and tell that story. And, and then you know, I, I wrote articles from Manga Bay about that experience. And then it, it ended up being sort of a part of the book. And that's the kind of storytelling that I really like to do when I can. I love to shine light on those species that really haven't gotten the attention that at least I feel <laughs> they deserve, you know. So yeah, that that's probably the weirdest animal I've, you know, in, in the sense of like, it's hard to find something stranger than the Selenodon. And if, if people don't know what it is, please look up a picture or video of it. This is, it's a wild thing. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. it's so cool. I saw, I think your website has a picture of one, I think. And, yeah. And we the got article to, so on we, Monica, Monica Bay. We met a female and my wife was there and we took a bunch of pictures and, and we were there. We weren't there just to, you know, to bug this poor creature, but we were there with scientists who were studying it. And that's usually kind of how I travel is I try and find somebody on the ground who knows something. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't just go run around after this thing on my own. And the whole story of how they catch it, how what they do, why they're there is also part of the book. And it's a really fascinating sort of story of, of conservation science on the ground. And then I just, I'm just along for the ride. I'm just along to, to have that five minutes with this beautiful creature that we'll, I'll never forget. That's amazing. And I think that's important because, you know, scientists are too busy or conservationists on the field to really write and share these stories. That's why I like talking to journalists and authors, you know, because you're getting the story out to the people who, who need to hear yeah, it. Yeah. And I would be a terrible scientist. You know, that, that's yeah. the thing about kind of your strengths, right? As scientists, yeah. you know, it's funny when you, some of them I think are getting better at the community, at knowing how to communicate with the media and stuff. But, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's a tendency where they speak in their science jargon, they speak in their language. They, they, they're passionate often, but they don't necessarily know how to communicate to the general public. And so I see my job as often trying to tell a bit of their story through my eyes as a sort of someone who is <laughs> often baffled by what they're doing. And then, you know, portraying that to an audience that hopefully then can kind of be a bridge between the scientific conservation world and the general audience. And, and that's sort of where I see a lot of wildlife journalism is sort of trying to, and because humans react, we react to stories. You know, we are a storytelling species. That's one of the main ways that we communicate and interact. And so I, you know, I think a lot of the good wildlife science journalists are ones that are able to tell, to try and tell those stories in a way that a general audience wants to sort of glaze over or be confused, you know? Right. And so that's, that's kind of how I see my role. I think that's really important. So you also wrote a lot of your writings about uh, Tam. So I was mm -hmm. going to just have you introduce to our audience who Tam is. And and uh, yeah. he, he really influenced uh, your life, I think. so. He did. So Tam was a Sumatran rhino in Malaysian Borneo that I got to visit in, oh, I'm trying to remember the exact year. I think it was 2009. And he had... So sort of some background here. By that point, the Sumatran rhino was considered to maybe have 250 or so left. A Sumatran rhino is like the Selenodon, this strange creature that is not, <laughs> this is sort of very unusual. They are the smallest rhino in the world. They are tropical rhinos. So they live, you know, in places like Indonesia and Malaysia, although no longer in Malaysia, unfortunately. Yeah. And they are hairy. They are sort of strange looking these small eyes they don't and they don't act like you're like you when you think of a rhino when i've been to you know parts of africa you know the white rhino and the black rhino there's a, there's sort of this reputation for them to sort of charge and be kind of mean i've been yeah, uh, yeah kind of mean and I, yeah. i've been in a vehicle while a white rhino was charging us i mean awesome experience <laughs> but it was Same so here. funny to, to me right it's yeah. a throwing rye it's like i don't want to um, die yeah. <laughs> don't die uh, you know, and they, they, they have, they don't have great eyesight and they're really, you know, obviously understandably defensive because there's lions and stuff. But the, the Sumatran rhino was really surprising because when I went and visited Tam and Tam was the first one I've met, I've since met several more, they are really affectionate and they really attach themselves to the people. So, so Tam had been found in a palm oil plantation. He had had a snare injury and he literally just one day walked into the palm oil plantation and this is in an area where, you know, people thought there were Sumatran rhinos, but no one had seen one for a while. And so 
luckily they had wildlife. People got there fast because if there was a potential that, you know, that Tam could have been just butchered and sold on the, oh. uh, on the market for parts. So luckily wildlife people got there fast and he was kept when I saw him in a, a basically in the rainforest he would have lived in, but in a large pen, right. With like fricking security guards and stuff, you know, making sure that because obviously his horn in certain parts of Asia is worth so much money for ridiculous reasons. But right. so he was kept in protection. One of the last of his kind, one of the last Bornean, one of the last born rhinos on Borneo. There are, as far as we know, I think only one or two left now. Wow. There's one in captivity now in Borneo. That's, but then there might be another one. There's some ch- chatter about that. But anyway, he was one of the last of his kind. And when I, so when I met him, I was, I knew I was meeting an animal again where I'm, this is one of the last of its species. This is a type of rhino that goes back, I think, 20 or 30 million years evolutionary. It's, it's more closely related to the woolly rhino, which went extinct, than it is to any other rhino. Yeah. but he was so personable and like so curious and just smelling me and then they also do this thing where they they speak they they sing really it sounds oh, like a dolphin cool. yeah they make this yeah, look it up on youtube there's some videos of them singing and that and, and no one knows why they do that there's been so little research on this animal it's it's a there's there's a theory that maybe because they're in the dense rainforest they sort of do that to communicate to each other but it's the bizarrest thing to have this 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 massive you know smallest rhino but it's still huge <laughs> animal like bumping its head against me like nuzzling me and then just like singing to me like asking me for food or asking me who am i or where did i come from why do i smell so different than its usual friends you know whatever it was doing it was just it it really imparted i think the urgency and you know that we're not we're talking about saving species but we're also talking about individual lives and, you know, unfortunately, Tam passed away, I believe it was 2019. Wow. And he never, due to a lot of politics and poor decision making, at least from my perspective, he never, never was able to reproduce. They tried. His sperm was not great, but there's a lot of other politics going on. I do, I think they have his sperm still frozen. So there's a chance yeah. that his genetics could continue in some way, but I think, you know, one of the things that, I, you know, when you have that personal of an experience, when you have that intimate of experience with something that is almost out of the world, I think it really does change the stakes and how you feel about, I mean, I was already, you know, massively concerned about extinction and, and, and deforestation and climate change, basically what we're, how we're treating our mother earth. You know, you, you have an experience like that. And I've had numerous ones with different species. And it's just really eye opening, you know, that we've that we've gone down this course with so little thought and with so little understanding yeah. that we could sort of obliterate a species like this for really dumb reasons. <laughs> I mean, palm oil, yeah, palm oil, and <laughs> and just deforestation, and and you know, largely it was wiped up by the by the trade for horns historically. Yeah, and now there's just so few. So just to sort of update, there are Sumatran rhinos in Sumatra still. There's maybe if we're lucky 60 to 80 wow, left there's don't know the exact number off the top of my head but seven or eight or nine or something in captivity and i've met most of them and they are talking about now trying to capture some more because basically what's happening is is most of the females we have are having fertility problems and so we need some young healthy females to produce more babies they've produced two babies in the last few years in captivity um, or is it this is in captivity yeah, yeah. okay uh, there, there there is some evidence of breeding in the wild still so that's a good sign mm-hmm. but the populations are so small that basically what will happen is is probably over time unless we get some females in captivity and by captivity we're not talking like necessarily a zoo this is like like where tam was like it's it's an, an enclosure with like you know a few acres of rainforest for each animal and it's literally like you can't I mean, I had to get special permission, obviously, to go. It's not like it's not open to tourists, you know, and they have armed guards and they have, you know, some of the best rhino mines in the world working on this. So I don't want to give the impression that it's just like, you know, there used to be some actually in the in the American Zoo. And, and it was the Cincinnati Zoo that sort of cracked how to breed them because there was so much difficulty in breeding them. So props to props to them. <laughs> um, but they, they are now all in Indonesia all the ones that we know of that are left and it's okay. probably about like i said 60 to 80 maybe if we're lucky and there's you know there was some there's this plan now to capture some more to hopefully the idea is what we really need to do is create a captive population that's an insurance against extinction 
If you can create a captive population with enough animals breeding and enough new babies, you can at least say, okay, you know, down the road when we have a large enough population and this continues to work, we can start re-releasing them back into the wild under protection, right? Mm-hmm. But the the where we are now is it's so uncertain that leaving all of them in the wild, the chances are that they would probably wink out over time due to poaching and snaring and, and other and other things. So that's sort of the plan. It's it's an ongoing story. It's a really tragic story. Mm-hmm. Breaks my heart. <laughs> but I would really suggest people look look up this species, watch it on YouTube a little bit, check it out. You can see the birth of one of the recent ones on, on YouTube. It's an incredible thing. Oh, I didn't see uh, that. It's, it's such a beautiful animal and they're so lovely. And there's just so much we don't know about how they interact with the ecosystem and what they do. But as a large forest dwelling mammal and one of the last large forest dwelling mammals, they certainly play a massive ecological role as well. So, Well, I was going to ask too, since your, your studies or your visits with TAM and, and, and research in this area, how do I word this? Like, you know, we, we can try to get them into these refuge, you know, in, you know, centers or whatever and, and kind of save mm-hmm. the species. But what what's going on with, like, the deforestation? Is there going to be enough land to re-release them to the wild well, where they can so, thrive somewhat? Or Sure. The, the yeah. deforestation in palm oil is an absolute disaster. Yeah. <laughs> we'll start with that yeah. for life across Southeast Asia. Mm-hmm. The deforestation there is is. So was the worst in the world. I wonder if now the Amazon is starting to eclipse it again, um, unfortunately. So it's a, it's a huge issue. It's, it's, it's a little bit less of an issue for the rhinos because there are a number of large established parks that mm-hmm. rhinos could be re-released into. The problem with the rhinos is that they became so few in number. And what we've learned or what we believe is that the females, when they're not mating regularly, basically start having fertility problems and eventually turns into uterine cancer. Mm-hmm. So if a female is not finding a male over a number of years, it starts to lose its ability to mate and pr- produce, you know, and these are animals that are already slow breeding. You know, I think they just half nearly two years and then they, the baby stays with the mom for two years. And so it's just it's one like baby, four, right? One, one, one baby, baby at, at a time. time. One baby at a time. So we're talking about, you know, most of the large mammals that are slow breeding like that, we've already, we wiped out in the Pleistocene. Like we already, you know, this is a, this is a, somehow this species, and I don't know how it managed to hang on as long as it has, but we have a chance now to save it. But so there is area, there's, there's looser, has vast area, there's, there's a number of parks that they vanish from that could be rewilded. And these are parks that where the borders are pretty good, where there are people passionate about it, the people that are working on the ground to stop illegal deforestation and infringement. So there are places they can go, for sure. But that aside, the, that doesn't, the deforestation palm oil issue is still massive for pretty much every other species in that region. And it's one of the most yeah. species rich regions in the world, right? Indonesia and, and Malaysia and Borneo and things like that. So I don't want to underscore the, the, both the, the, the loss to species, but also the, the climate impacts of what's happening in that part of the world the burning, the fires, the the draining of peatlands, all this stuff is absolutely awful. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't, it's interesting because the rhino story is so, somewhat separate from that because their issues are so different based on them just being this, this slow breeding animal with this sort of uh, wonky breeding system. Have you seen any changes, like any major changes with the palm oil or deforestation? There are incredibly passionate people working on the ground, you know, both a lot of wonderful local Indonesians who have made it their life's purpose to try and save as much habitat as possible in forests, and not just for species, but also for indigenous tribes and local people who have lost access to the land that they use for millennia to fish and hunt and live in, you know? Um, So it's, it's not even just that it's a, it's an ecological disaster. It's a human rights disaster too. But I, I would say that I, the, the government still seem pretty, you know, more towards the, I mean, there's, there's, there's obviously back and forth and lip service and stuff, but the deforestation continues, the burning continues, the, the idea that the only way to prosperity and, and happiness for their people is to sort of destroy the environment, which honestly they got from us because that's basically what, how we did it and, you know, how we sort of argued it, Right. But we are now seeing the impacts of that both locally. And I mean, the, the, the asthma rates and the respiratory deaths in this part of the world are off the charts because of all the burning. Yeah. But then you have the impacts, of course, on climate change, right? Where this, this is deforestation and, and burning of forests is one of the, you know, one of the largest land use emitters. 
So I don't see a lot of change and, and most of the change I've seen in the last few years, especially in places like Brazil, mm -hmm. have been going backwards. And that's something that I think continues to need to be told. Maybe, you know, with our new administration in the U.S., maybe they'll be able to, if they, since they're putting climate change much more front and center than has ever been before, maybe that will start to move some of these things. But so far, it's 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 the story isn't really a good one. Not to say that there isn't successes in certain places, and there's incredible people and NGOs working every day to try and save, you know, thousands of species in that part of the world and, and, and just keep forest standing. But I don't I don't see the government making that the a priority. Wow, it's too bad. So yeah. it's really sad. And this just a side question that just came up as you were talking, you know, doing a lot of this, you, you see a lot of destruction and extinction on the edge of extinction. Anyways, I, do you deal, do you get compassion fatigue? I mean, does oh, that, yeah. I mean, you get compassion fatigue and you just get depressed, <laughs> you know, especially like in the last year with the COVID and everything. I think I got to a point where I just, I couldn't even really you know, I'm here, I'm an environmental journalist, and I started having a really hard time reading any environmental news. Yeah. I was just like, right. so it does happen. And I think that that is one thing I, I work with young journalists, uh, interns at Manga Bay still. And, you know, it's one thing that's one of the questions that's always brought up is how do you kind of survive this like constant onslaught of awful news? Yeah. And, you know, you build resilience, you find hope where you can. I do think that we're sort of in this bottleneck period in, in history where, we sort of have two routes we can go. One route is kind of post-apocalyptic, awful world mm -hmm. <laughs> to live in for our children and other children. The other route is that we, you know, we, we, we rise to meet the the challenges and we start to turn these things around. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm not someone who believes we've ran out of time. Let me put it that way. I do have That's some hope and some optimism, right? I've, I know people who think we've run out of time and I've had very interesting conversations with them. <laughs> and they think I'm, I'm crazy. Yeah. But I'm not someone who thinks we've run out of time. I mean, you know, so, and maybe that's deluding myself, but, you know, I have a 10 year old daughter and I have to believe that, you know, we can rise to meet some of these challenges and at least give the next generation a chance to continue the good work yeah. or the good trouble or however you want to put it and, 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 and move forward for a more, you know, an earth that we can actually sustain, not just ourselves, but all the you know, species that make it work <laughs> and, and, and we are blessed. With. Well, that, well, that gives me hope then too. I know I find talking to so many people with the podcast, it can be kind of a downer <laughs> and hard to yeah, keep the hope. But, you know, well, yeah. the, the environmental field right now is, 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 it's really a downer. And, mm -hmm. but I do think it, it's one of those things where you have to have some historical perspective and there are some interesting large scale changes happening around the world, especially around, Things like the population, you know, the the fertility rates around the world are just plunging. It, you know, we're looking at maybe getting to a point in the next few generations where the pop the human population will sort of stabilize. And and you know, there are again, if we could just sort of harness some of our energies and change some of our ways, you know, we don't need to be burning fossil fuels for energy anymore. We have all these other alternatives. You know, we don't need to be cutting down thousands of millions of year old forests for raw materials. We have other better ways to do this. There's lots of just leftover land that no one's using around the world. But a lot of this comes down to sort of the short term capitalistic kind of, you know, endless, endless production and, and consumption versus sort of a longer term, wiser, sustainable. And I use this word sustainable as its actual meaning, not like some greenwash BS that companies put out. Like, I mean, like, you know, yeah, sustainable fishing means you could fish in the same place forever and never run out of that fish right like it really means something that you can you, that, that humans can use but that we use in a way that it doesn't deplete the 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 source right right so you know if, if we if we start to turn towards that route you know and i do think you know there is a clock there is we're not gonna we're not gonna we can't we don't have forever to make these decisions right. but i do have a lot of hope looking at the next generations that that i think the awareness around climate change is much greater in younger people than it is and people, you know, my age and older, the understanding of it as a as an existential threat, and we kind of throw that word around, but that really means like the existence of humans, like, <laughs> yeah. and and other species. Yeah. So I, I do think that there is some hopeful signs, but I, I do worry that the 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 non hopeful signs, you know, that side continues to sort of 
win in certain places and continues to pummel and continues to hold everything back. And, you know, we're going to have to change eventually. We're going to have to either change smartly and wisely, or we're going to be just forced to change. And then it's going to be a pretty ugly world. Are you of the belief that individually we can all make a difference by altering our own personal habits? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's, that's a, you know, it's interesting. There's this debate right now going on about how much to sort of push. I'm not, I, I'm all for individual change. And I'm mostly, honestly, in part because it changes our mindset. Mm-hmm. It changes how we view the world and how we think about things. But I am increasingly of the mind that we don't want to there's so much sort of guilt placed on individuals, right? Oh my gosh, you have a car that burns a certain amount of fuel or, oh my gosh, you know, you, you, you bought that with palm oil. Like, you know, there's so like, but what we need to change it's, it's, and this is how corporations have gotten away with this, right? Is they say, Oh, the problem is the individual making the choice. Well, it's like, no, the problem is you people. Right. And so I feel like it's, it's, I'll say this, it's better to put our energies into voting, into making corporations change into changing our system than it is into worrying about every little thing that we do. I mean, I mean, I try to, you know, I don't eat much meat. I, you know, we, we have energy. Like I've done some things in our life that, you know, we try to do in a, as small of a way as I can for us personally. But I think, you know, again, if I would rather see people put their energies towards larger scale change, towards organizing, towards pressuring people, towards just voting, every time you can vote, you know, mm-hmm. then, then, then necessarily being always super obsessive because I mean, as someone with OCD, I've, I've been there mm-hmm. about every little decision you make and how it's going to impact everything. Right. It's true. Yeah. Um, we need, we need big, large scale blanket changes. Even if let's say, let's say 10% of Americans stopped eating palm oil or stopped eating meat or whatever. I mean, that would be great. That would help some, you know, but it would do very answer. little on the larger front. Right. So that's where I think I, I, it took me years to come to that realization, but I really think that that's where the energy needs to be placed is we need to hold governments accountable to hold corporations accountable. Like that is where the, you know, government sort of gave all the, this is sort of me going on a ramp, but government sort no, of gave all that. the power to corporations, right? They sort of said, Oh, neo-capitalism, let's just, you can, you guys can, you know, just sort of regulate yourselves. We'll be fine. And then they said, Oh, well, we can't change what corporations do. We're, 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 you know, we're weak. We're just governments. Like, we can't. And it's like, no, you know, we can, we can force our governments to change the way corporations interact. And then, you know, boom, you can start seeing large scale changes. And that does, that means we're going to have to sacrifice some stuff or, you know, sacrifice some, you know, when I say sacrifice, it's like, you know, basically little things here and there and how we live our lives. It's not huge things, but maybe, you know, less plastic comes to our door you know, maybe we all start eating less meat and we, you know, or meat becomes more expensive or fossil fuels become way more expensive, you know, things like that. We have to start making those changes. Those changes are going to come no matter what. Right. But doing it in a way where we say as voters, as, as citizens, as in, you know, God love it still, hopefully a democracy around the world. This isn't just America, but everybody, mm-hmm. you know, if we can start holding the the way we use materials and the way corporations interact and the way our governments sort of hand over power. I think that's where I see the most potential for change rather than sort of saying, well, you know, don't, don't take that toothpick that was made from a rainforest. Like, you know, if you think of it, don't take the toothpick, but like also it don't, 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 don't wake up at 3 a.m. being like, why did I take that tooth? You know what I mean? Like, I know I totally get it. That makes sense. We touched on COVID a little bit, but I have you, are you, when, when's your next trip once we can uh, travel again? Oh, <laughs> are you planning something already? Uh, anywhere. <laughs> um, no, I, so when, when COVID hit, it was funny because I was like warning all my friends. I'm like, this is going to be real bad. And they're like, Jeremy, you're crazy. You're yeah. over exaggerating. For once, for the one time in my you're life, right. I was right. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm really sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> So I was supposed to go to Indonesia to continue reporting on Sumatran rhinos because I've somehow become like the Sumatran rhino person. <laughs> so I think that Indonesia would probably, be, you know, but it would all depend on, you know, even if I got the vaccine, I would want it to be not in a place where I would potentially risk other people. And, and I'd have to see how Indonesia is doing. You know, I mean, like it would really depend on so many factors. I don't want to bring any risk to anyone I would be traveling with. Even with a vaccine, you know, there's potential for still carrying something. Mm-hmm. So I'd have to be really, I would have to be really wise about that. So 
<clears throat> but I think Indonesia would be near the top of the list just because I'm really keen to continue to see where the Sumatran rhino story goes. A lot of it was put on hold with COVID. Right. They were, you know, getting, you know, trying to trap these massive animals in a rainforest is really difficult, can often take years. Yeah. And so they were starting the process of, of, of following certain animals or keeping tabs on them and figuring out, okay, how do we capture what's the safest way to do it? And then, of course, COVID hit and, you know, um, understandably, they had to put it on hold. So, but I, I think that would be a, one of the top places for my job work-wise. I would love, though, to get back to the Amazon. I would love to get back to Sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, I've, there's certain places that are just so ingrained in my heart that I I miss and yearn for them, you know. But a lot of it is is deciding what is the most, again, what is the best place given the the cost and the carbon footprint. I mean, I always try and offset, obviously, the carbon footprint from where I'm traveling, but still, it's, it ex- you know, it exists. You know, what is the best place to tell the best story? You know, where, where do I kind of feel like I'm my 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 sort of set of talents are, are most needed versus someone else could do it better or someone else who's living there closer could do it. So and also I only, you know, I travel maybe when I, when I, when we could travel, I travel like once a year at most, just because it is such a challenging thing. And also because of the carbon footprint. Right. So that's, that's probably, but I would probably, Indonesia would probably be the top of the list, but man, if I could get in the Amazon, oof, so good. I know that's what we've been thinking yeah. about too. It's one of the best places. If you can ever go there for just one time in your life, it's, it's the most amazing place on earth, really, you know, mm-hmm. as far as being so biodiverse, so rich in life where you can actually get far enough deep enough in where you know it's just it's a it's a different way of experiencing reality i mean it's it's really amazing so it's 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 i love it nice i know for me just getting back to michigan to see family is i'm right? looking forward yeah. to that i was gonna say ireland would be ireland would be certainly <laughs> up to see some family there yeah. you know or just even like going down south we're in the middle of winter here in st paul so yeah somewhere where it's warm you know <laughs> Well, awesome. Well, we did talk. Usually my last question is what gives you hope? And, and I think you touched on that a little bit. But do you have any other insight of what, what gives you any hope? Yeah, if- I mean, part of, part of the story of the book is resilience, you know, and it's, and it's about both the resilience of, of living with mental illness, mm-hmm. which I think anyone who's lived with mental illness for a while can attest to how much resilience is sort of needed, but also the resilience of nature. I mean, this is one thing that, you know, there are species that have been near to the edge of extinction. Uh, the European bison is an example I always throw out, you know, like down to, I think, 12 or 14 individuals. Now there's four, five, 600, all, all being rewilded around Europe. I actually went to Poland and saw them in the wild. Oh, wow. An incredible, successful story. And there are a number of conservation stories for wildlife, particularly in that, in that same vein. And, and, you know, so I think that, that those stories, you know, do give me hope. I think, again, younger people, there seems to be a rising consciousness and awareness. Mm -hmm. I hope that continues with them and I hope they stick to it as they enter adulthood because I know there can be a lot of, when you enter adulthood, you suddenly become cynical and and short-sighted. I don't know why that happens. (laughs) So I think that those things do give me hope. I mean, one one of the joys of being an environmental journalist is I get to, you know, write about and meet people who are passionate and who have devoted their lives to literally saving a single species, you know. They've devoted their entire lives to this one species that may, you know, go extinct in their lifetime or maybe after they pass away and they're no longer its champion, boom, that species is done for, you know, but the fact that they do that, the fact that they have that hope, the fact that they, they have that passion, I think is, is infectious Mm -hmm. and really has added a lot of meaning to my life. And so I think that those kinds of things obviously give me hope. I mean, are we, we are beset by a lot of very destructive forces and a lot of greed and, and just, I think, brokenness. But I do think that, you know, if, if, if enough of us choose, you know, a, a new, a different path and it's, it's, you know, it's kind of scary because it's an uncharted path. Humans haven't really figured out, we haven't really figured out how would this work economically? How would this work politically? How, how are things going to, you know, look in sort of an era where we would act, actually be acting on climate change and mass extinction and, all the other issues we have, plastic and fishing and, you know, what would it look like if we actually got serious about those overnight? We don't know. And so that's, that's scary for people, but, you know, I think it would be a much more beautiful world for our children and grandchildren to inherit than the one we're um, sort of giving them right now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I hope, (laughs) I guess. (laughs) I know it's kind of, no, it's a great, it's such a good question. And, and, you know, hope isn't, 
isn't meant to be certain and isn't meant to be something that is even always realistic, but you know, that's, it's what, it's what's driven the best humans throughout the ages, whether it be, you know, MLK Jr. or Gandhi or, you know, right. Tolstoy, all these people, you know, that, that, you know, Mother Teresa, you know, these, these people, they didn't live off seeing the world and being like, oh, you know, this is, I'm going to get really despair. And I guess there's nothing I can do about it. They, yeah. they didn't give up. They weren't cynical for sure. Mm -hmm. um, they had hope and, you know, it doesn't mean that they thought that all their aspirations would come true, but they just kept, kept doing the work. I like that. It drives us and keeps us going. So, it does. so I know your time is valuable and, but where can people find your book? And other writing. Sure. You can go to jeremyhands.com, which has, which is my website and my books on there. And it lists sort of all the different places. Like the book is available pretty much wherever books are sold. Mm -hmm. And obviously a lot of us are doing online shopping now. There's, there's a great place called bookshop.org where you can literally order from your local bookstore mm -hmm. and sort of support those places. That's a really good place to go. And it's, it's on there. It's also available. This is really cool in both like ebook, but also there's a really great audio book version that was done by like a professional voice actor with lots of awards. So that's if, if you're someone who likes to listen rather than read, it's it's available there. So that's you can pretty much get it anywhere though. Awesome. Well, I will post links on the show notes and everything for everybody or you. So, and I just I enjoyed talking to you, Jeremy. So I really appreciate you. your time. Cool. It was Thank fun. You for <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. Let's do it again. Definitely. Catch up when you write another book and, and some other yeah. things. <laughs> Thank you for listening. And please check out Jeremy's book either on his website, jeremyhands.com, or wherever you buy your books. Please visit our website, www.beprovided.com, for the show notes and other stories. There are pictures of Tam and the Selenodon that Jeremy spoke about, as well as a YouTube video of a singing Sumatra rhino on our, on our website as well. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. Thank you.